morning students in today's class we will be studying about amino acid metabolism urea cycle and the tricarboxylic acid cycle the objectives are to enable you all to understand the way amino acids are metabolized in the body and also to acquire knowledge about the degradative cycle of these amino acids leading to excretion as urea and the third part will deal with the second respiratory cycle that is the TCA cycle and its importance in metabolism of nutrients to energy. To summarize today's class, proteins are composed of amino acids which you are already aware of and these are either degraded to urea and excreted or shunted into other biosynthetic pathways and these pathways connect with other important metabolic cycles in the body and TCA cycle is the intermediate cycle for metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and their conversion to energy. So, the class is essentially divided into three modules. The first module deals with the metabolism of amino acids. The second module deals with the urea cycle and its reactions in detail and the third module deals with the tricarboxylic acid cycle. In module 1 we will see that humans are totally dependent on other organisms for converting atmospheric nitrogen into different forms that are available to the body. As you all know proteins are comprised of nitrogen which is an element exclusive to this nutrient and this nitrogen should be obtained from the soil and the environment. Nitrogen fixation is carried out by bacterial nitrogenases which are enzymes that form reduced nitrogen like ammonia which can then be used by all organisms to form amino acids and other nitrogen containing compounds. If you look at this picture either nitrogen N2 or nitrate and nitrite NO2 and NO3 are reduced by a number of enzymes like the reductases, the nitrogenase complexes, the glutamate dehydrogenase and the glutamine synthase all of which incorporate nitrogen into animal diets in the form of proteins which are comprised of amino acids. Now these animal diets and the plant proteins when consumed by humans are taken up by gastric digestion and uptake and there is a cycle in which the liberated ammonia which is reduced form of nitrogen, nitrate and nitrite is incorporated into glutamate which is again converted into glutamine and these amino acids as well as other amino acids which are generated within the body are incorporated into human proteins for serving the purpose of human nutrition. There are many other reactions of amino acids also which are comprised under the group of amino acid metabolism. Metabolism as you all know mean anabolism and catabolism which means synthesis and degradation. So, through degradation amino acids are either deaminated that is their nitrogen group is removed and keto acids are formed. The liberated ammonia is excreted in the form of urea. The keto acids enter what is called as the citric acid cycle to be oxidized to energy. During synthesis the opposite of deamination occurs which is called amination of keto acids where an amino group is added to the keto acids and also transamination where there is a, an exchange of amino group between keto acids and amino acids. This is the principal reaction called the glutamate dehydrogenase reaction. If you see the figure an ammonia a free ammonia adds itself to a keto acid called alpha ketoglutarate 
which is the principal keto acid that is formed in the citric acid cycle. These two together form the amino acid glutamate, which is the pathway or the gateway to all other metabolic pathways of amino acids. In the process, two hydrogens are taken from the coenzyme NADPH2 and transferred to the alpha ketoglutarate ammonia complex to form glutamate. Another important reaction is when glutamate is converted to glutamine by the help of the enzyme glutamine synthase using ATP as energy. Glutamine is another important amino acid which is required for protein synthesis. So, nitrogen metabolism in a sense forms reduced nitrogen entering the human body as dietary free amino acids proteins as well as the ammonia produced by the intestinal tract bacteria. A pair of principal enzymes as I already said glutamate dehydrogenase and glutamine synthase are found in all organisms and essentially affect the conversion of ammonia into amino acids. Amino and amide groups from these two substances are freely transferred to the other carbon skeletons by transamination and transamidation. So, glutamate occupies a key position in amino acid biosynthesis as well as degradation for three reasons. It is the major gateway for the entrance of ammonia into nitrogenous substances or constituents of plants. It is capable of transamination with keto acids corresponding to almost every known amino acid. Each amino acid has its corresponding keto acid and it is the last step in amino acid degradation being the precursor for a number of new amino acids that are synthesized within the body. Now, what is transamination? We have been talking about this. Transamination is when, when amino acid 1 which can be glutamate transfers its ammonia group to keto acid 1 which can be a pyruvate and then keto acid 1 becomes amino acid 2 which can be an alanine and amino acid 1 gets converted to keto acid 2 which is alpha ketoglutarate. So, it is like a ping pong mechanism where ammonia groups are transferred between amino acids and keto acids to form a new set of an amino acid keto acid pair. In this reaction pyridoxal phosphate which is a B complex vitamin is the coenzyme which helps in transferring of the amino between the amino acid and the keto acid. Now, amino acids can be grouped into different families based on the chemical similarities and only a few starting compounds which are mostly keto acids can be synthesized from these keto acids and these are regarded as members of five families. The first and foremost is the glutamate family starting with alpha ketoglutarate which is a keto acid formed in the citric acid cycle. The second is the aspartate family where aspartate is an amino acid with the starting compound being oxaloacetate which is also a key member of the citric acid cycle. The third is the alanine valine leucine group which originates from another important keto acid called pyruvate which is the end product of breakdown of glucose which is called glycolysis. Then you have the serine glycine group which originates from 3 phosphoglycerate which is a key intermediate of the glycolytic pathway. And the last is the family of the aromatic amino acids which originate from another key intermediate of the glycolytic pathway that is phosphoenol pyruvate and erythrose 4 phosphate. These two are important members of glycolysis as well as the pentose phosphate pathway in which glucose is oxidized. 
So, here is the pictorial representation where alpha ketoglutarate gives rise to glutamate which in turn gets converted to glutamine, proline and arginine. Similarly, oxaloacetate gives rise to aspartate which in turn gives rise to asparagine, methionine, lysine and threonine and pyruvate gives rise to alanine, valine, leucine and isoleucine. 3 phosphoglycerate which originates within the glycolytic pathway synthesizes serine, glycine and cysteine and the alanine, valine, leucine group originates from pyruvate. The starting compound is alanine and valine and leucine are synthesized independently of each other by elongation of the pyruvate chain. In the aromatic amino acid family, chorismate is the key intermediate in the synthesis of the amino acids, tryptophan, phenylalanine and tyrosine all are ring structures. So, finally, if you see the metabolic fate of amino acids, the amino acids which come from dietary proteins can be converted into ammonia and the carbon skeletons of the keto acid. Ammonia is converted to urea through the urea cycle and excreted, whereas keto acids go through the citric acid cycle to form energy or they can be reversed into formation of glucose through the gluconeogenetic pathway. And there is an intermediate shunt or pathway, small pathway which connects the citric acid cycle to the urea cycle where aspartate passes through what is called as the arginosuccinate shunt. Now, the urea cycle where we start understanding the various reactions of the urea cycle. Now, if not reused for synthesis of new amino acids or other nitrogen and products, the amino groups are channeled into a single excretory end product which is called urea. So, most of the aquatic species like the bony fishes are called ammonotelic because they excrete amino nitrogen as ammonia itself without the need to convert it to urea. Then the toxic ammonia is simply diluted by the surrounding water into which they excrete it. Terrestrial animals require pathways for nitrogen excretion that minimize toxicity and water loss and therefore, they need the urea cycle. Most terrestrial animals are ureotelic excreting amino nitrogen in the form of urea while Birds and reptiles are uricotelic, excreting amino nitrogen as uric acid. Plants recycle virtually all amino groups and nitrogen excretion occurs only under very unusual circumstances. They utilize the nitrogen within the plant itself. So, basically in the urea cycle, the ammonia is deposited in the mitochondrion of the liver cells which are called the hepatocytes and this is converted to urea. This pathway was first discovered by Hans Krebs in 1932. He is the same person who discovered the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle along with a medical student associate called Kurt Henslate. Now, urea production almost exclusively occurs in the liver and the liver cells and is the fate of most of the ammonia which is channeled there. The urea passes into the bloodstream and thus from there to the kidneys and is excreted into the urine. This picture shows you what happens in the urea cycle both outside the cell in the cytosol as well as within the mitochondrion that is the energy rich organelle of the cell. Very similar to what happens in the citric acid cycle, ammonia liberated from the amino acids is converted to a compound called carbamyl phosphate by absorbing the 
carbon dioxide from the bicarbonate which is available within the cell cytosol. Now, carbamyl phosphate enters the urea cycle by combining with a molecule of ornithine and forming a compound called citrulline. Only this step of the urea cycle occurs within the mitochondrion. Now, once citrulline is formed, it is excreted into the cytosol again. It utilizes ATP in the form of energy, separates out two phosphates in the form of a pyrophosphate and forms a complex with adenosine monophosphate after the two phosphates are separated out. A citrullyl AMP intermediate is formed which is transitory and unstable. This is quickly converted to arginosuccinate by combining with aspartate. This aspartate is coming from the mitochondrion from the citric acid cycle where alpha ketoglutarate through transamination is converted to aspartate gets shunted out into the cytosol and combines with arginosuccinate. This is what is called as the aspartate arginosuccinate shunt which combines the citric acid cycle with the urea cycle. Arginosuccinate is again split into a molecule called fumarate which joins the citric acid cycle and the remaining molecule is arginine it is an amino acid. Now, arginine again gets split into urea which is excreted and it regenerates back the ornithine to combine with another molecule of carbamyl phosphate within the mitochondrion. So, our ornithine crosses the cytosolic region by crossing the barrier of the mitochondrial membrane and enters the mitochondrion to start another cycle of urea formation. In the last reaction of the urea cycle which is called step 4, the cytosolic enzyme arginase cleaves arginine to yield urea and ornithine and as I already mentioned ornithine is transported into the mitochondria to initiate another round of urea cycle. I have already spoken about the link between the urea cycle and the citric acid cycle where molecules pass in and out of the mitochondrion. The citric acid cycle and its enzymes are located completely within the mitochondrion as you can see within the figure given here and the urea cycle except for the first step takes place in the cytosol. The arginosuccinate shunt passes the molecules from the mitochondrion to the cytosol through its shunt. Now, in module 3, we shall deal with the tricarboxylic acid cycle to which amino acid metabolism is linked to form energy. As you all know, proteins, carbohydrates as well as lipids, all three are sources of energy, but proteins are usually spared for its other function. Only as a last resort, is protein metabolism diverted to energy metabolism and this is through the citric acid cycle. So, the reverse reaction links amino acid metabolism with the TCA cycle activity. Why I say reverse reaction is in case amino acids are not utilized for synthesis of other proteins, enzymes etcetera, they go back in the reverse direction to form energy. So, here glutamate dehydrogenase provides an oxidizable carbon source which is used for the production of energy as well as the reduced electron carrier NADH as expected for a branch point enzyme with an important link to energy metabolism glutamate dehydrogenase is regulated by cellular energy change. So, ATP and GTP if they are available they are positive allosteric effectors of the formation of glutamate 
whereas ADP and GDP availability which indicates energy depleted state of the cell, they are positive allosteric effectors of the reverse reaction. Thus, when the level of ATP is high, conversion of glutamate to the keto acid alpha ketoglutarate and other TCA cycle intermediates is limited. And when the cellular energy change is low, glutamate is converted to ammonia and oxidizable TCA cycle intermediates which are called the keto acids. So, glutamate is also a principal amino acid donor to other amino acids in subsequent transamination reactions as was already explained in module 1. The multiple roles of glutamate in nitrogen balance make it a gateway between free ammonia and the amino groups of most of the amino acids. Now, coming to the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle, it is a hub in metabolism with degradative pathways leading in and anabolic pathways leading out and it is closely regulated in coordination with other pathways. It is also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the TCA cycle and or the Krebs cycle because its discoverer is the same Hans Krebs who discovered the urea cycle. Intermediates of this cycle are also siphoned off as biosynthetic precursors of many other biomolecules needed by the body. Now, this is the citric acid cycle. Acetyl-CoA is the main molecule which triggers off the citric acid cycle. The availability of acetyl-CoA to go into this cycle is again dependent upon the energy charge of the cell. When energy is in excess, it will not go into the cycle. When energy is depleted, it will go through a round of the cycle to form more ATP molecules and supply energy to the cell. Very similar to the urea cycle, acetyl-CoA is synonymous or similar to the role of carbamyl phosphate in the urea cycle. Just like there, where carbamyl phosphate has combined with ornithine, here acetyl-CoA combines with oxaloacetate to form citrate and this citrate through an unstable intermediate called aconitase forms isocitrate. The enzyme involved is aconitase. Isocitrate is further converted to alpha ketoglutarate which is a principal keto acid formed in the citric acid cycle. The enzyme involved is isocitrate dehydrogenase. Carbon dioxide is released during this reaction and the alpha ketoglutarate is further converted to succinyl CoA by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Number of coenzymes are involved here like thymine pyrophosphate, coenzyme A, NADH, FADH2, etc. Here also one molecule of carbon dioxide is released. With the release of each carbon dioxide, one carbon is getting reduced in the chain. Then succinyl CoA is again converted to succinate and then fumarate, malate and oxaloacetate which goes through another round of the citric acid cycle. As you are aware, alpha ketoglutarate, succinate, fumarate, malate, oxaloacetate all these are precursors for many amino acid biosynthetic reactions and they are also connecting between gluconeogenesis, urea cycle, transamination and energy formation. So, the citric acid cycle basically results in release of two carbon dioxides, formation of three NADH2s and one FADH2. In the next class, you will be learning how 3 NADH2s will yield 3 into 2.5 ATPs and 1 FADH2 will yield 1.5 ATP. So, in this manner, a number of ATP molecules are generated as a result of the citric acid cycle. This table gives the summary of energy formation 
from glycolysis to this TCA cycle which in essence is around 30 to 32 ATP molecules per cycle of glycolysis and citric acid cycle. So, you can imagine the amount of energy that is generated for each molecule of glucose that is metabolized. To conclude, amino acids are the breakdown products of proteins. They can be degraded into keto acids and ammonia. Ammonia is excreted from the body after conversion to urea through the urea cycle. Urea cycle is linked to the TCA cycle in metabolism and both share crucial intermediates. And the TCA cycle is the hub in metabolism of proteins, carbohydrates as well as lipids. I hope it was clear. See you in the next class where we will be dealing with oxidative phosphorylation or the third respiratory cycle of energy formation.